We've got a wonderful, wonderful event that we are celebrating with the investiture of our dear friend, Professor Arthur Leonard as the Robert F. Wagner Professor of Labor and Employment Law. Um, I'm Anthony Crowell, I'm the Dean and President here at the Law School, and Art is going to present his lecture titled, A Battle Over Statutory Interpretation, Title VII, and Claims of Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Discrimination. I just wanna say on a deeply personal level, I'm particularly honored and happy to have the opportunity to honor Art in this way, of which he is so incredibly deserving. So congratulations. For many years before I became dean here at the law school, which was in 2012, Art was someone whose work I knew very well and someone who I looked up to and admired greatly, even though I never had had the privilege to actually meet him face to face. And we got to do so when he was part of a dinner um, that the search committee for the dean held. And we sat next to each other and we hit it off right away and really talked a lot about his work in LGBT law and the work I was doing in the Bloomberg administration. And uh, it was very exciting to sit next to someone whose work I had uh, admired all those years. And so it was a great opportunity when I started the position to get to work with him directly as a colleague. And working with him has been certainly everything I've hoped for and much more as I've relied on his counsel and guidance greatly. And even more importantly, I consider him a dear friend. Art's not just a giant in the NYLS community, but he's one of the most important legal scholars in the nation when it comes to issues of employment law and anti-discrimination and gender equality law. And there couldn't be a better scholar than Art to have the honor of having the professorship named after Senator Robert F. Wagner, one of the most prominent graduates in our law school's 125 year history, and one of the most visible and forward thinking public servants of the 20th century. Robert Wagner graduated from NYLS in 1900. He quickly rose through the state's political ranks, serving in both houses of the New York State Legislature. And after leaving the New York State Senate, he chaired an investigation of the worst industrial disaster in the history of the state, that being the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire of 1911. 146 workers died, and the investigation led by Wagner led to dozens of new labor and safety laws and launched Wagner's legacy as one of the, the most important labor rights reformers. After serving for seven years as a New York State Supreme Court judge, Wagner was elected to the US Senate, serving for three terms. As a senator, he became possibly the most important figure in the New Deal, besides President Roosevelt, sponsoring the Social Security Act of 1936. He also sponsored the most important labor law of the 20th century, the National Labor Relations Act, known ever since as the Wagner Act. Besides establishing the National Labor Relations Board in 1935 and other employee protections, the act established American workers' right to collectively bargain without fear of losing their jobs. And like I said earlier, it's only fitting that one of our most groundbreaking and impactful scholars receive the honor of serving in a professorship named after Senator Wagner. Art received his undergraduate degree from Cornell's School of Industrial and Labor Relations, where he served as editor of the Industrial and Labor Relations Forum. And after Cornell, he attended Harvard Law School and he graduated in 1977. After graduating law school, he came to New York City as a young labor and employment lawyer working at a white shoe law firm, and he didn't know any other gay lawyers. So in 1978, he became the founding member of what now is known as the LGBT Bar Association of Greater New York, or LEGAL. Recognizing the need for professional support as a gay lawyer, in May 1978, Art placed an ad in the newspaper giving notice to other gay lawyers in New York City to join him in the living room of his apartment for social networking. Ten people met and organized what would be known early on as the New York Law Group and a movement was born. Like Senator Wagner, Art was well ahead of his time. Today, 37 years later, Legal is one of the nation's largest and most prominent LGBT bar associations. The opportunities that Legal has opened up for gay lawyers to network and support one another, to foster equality of treatment of LGBT community members in the justice system 
and to be an advocate for law firms and legal departments to embrace LGBT diversity has been nothing short of extraordinary. I count myself and many other members of the New York Law School community as beneficiaries of the path Art helped blaze. Art's leadership in the wider New York and national community is only matched by his leadership here at the law school, which he joined in 1982, allowing the school to be a pioneer. NYLS was among the first law schools in America to offer a course on sexuality and law. Art wrote the case book, of which we are incredibly proud, as well as his pioneering work on AIDS law. He is the author of books and dozens of articles, and to just highlight a couple of his most important works, he is the co-author of a law school textbook with Professor Patricia Kane titled Sexuality Law, and he's the author of Sexuality and the Law, an Encyclopedia of Major Legal Cases. Just as important as his academic scholarship are his monthly newsletters and podcast, both titled LGBT Law Notes and he writes several articles a week for the preeminent newspaper geared towards the LGBT community, Gay City News. He writes on breaking legal and policy developments happening across the country that affect the community. All of this is to say that he is without question the primary chronicler and analyst of development in laws and policies globally affecting the LGBT community. His contributions are especially important in the areas of LGBT LGBT rights in labor and employment contexts. He has produced numerous works of scholarship and chronicled developments over the years as workplaces and the laws governing them have started to take LGBT rights into account. Safe to say, without Art's unique ability to analyze and highlight these specific issues in real time, I doubt we would have benefited from the progress that has been made so far. Besides the gal, Art has been a leader for many legal organizations. He was a member of the New York City Bar Association's Committees on Sex and Law, which he chaired for several years, Labor and Employment Law, and AIDS and the Law. He was founding co-chair of the association's Special Committee on Lesbians and Gay Men in the Profession, which eventually became a standing committee. That committee on annually honors one or more lawyers for contributions to LGBT law with an award named after Art, who was its first recipient. In addition, Art was a founding member of the National LGBT Law Association, which presented him with the 2005 Dan Bradley Lifetime Achievement Award for service to the cause of LGBT legal rights. Art has also put MYLS on the map for employment and labor law and frequently serves as faculty advisor to the school's Robert F. Wagner Sr. National Labor and Employment Law Moot Court Competition. That's the nation's largest student-run moot court competition and the premier student competition focused on labor and employment law. Indeed, Senator Wagner's impact on our country's social safety net and protections for ordinary Americans continues to this day, and Art's work has continued that legacy and brought it into new areas of civil rights and worker protections. Linking anyone's work with someone as legendary as Robert Wagner is not taken lightly. And that's why today is special and appropriate. Art has inspired generations of LGBT students to pursue legal careers openly and proudly here at New York Law School and beyond. We thank him and NYLS offers the best LGBT scholarship and advocacy and opportunities for LGBT students in the nation as a result of his tireless efforts. Our entire community, faculty, staff, students, and alumni all recognize Art's extraordinary achievements, and we are eternally grateful for all that he has achieved for us and for those beyond our walls, both near and far. There's no one else like him, and it is my pleasure to ask him to come up here and present his lecture. Art. Thank you, Dean Crowell, uh, for that introduction which made me blush, uh, for the incredible leadership that you've been providing to this law school that so many of us love as we move through very difficult times in legal education and in our country. 
Thank you to all my colleagues who are here today and who provide such a vibrant and welcoming academic community for all of us here at NYLS. Uh, thank you to many friends and colleagues, former and current students, esteemed judges, alumni, who've made the time to participate in this event. Thank you for being here. This kicks off our annual round of reunion activities for the year. I feel particularly honored to have my name associated with that of U.S. Senator Robert F. Wagner, Sr., as you've heard, a member of our class of 1900, who was a hero of the New Deal, whose legislative leadership gave us such important achievements as the National Labor Relations Act, commonly known as the Wagner Act and the Social Security Act, laws that have shaped our nation for generations now. Senator Wagner was an immigrant who made an indelible mark on the United States. I hope that in some small way, I've made a contribution that makes this name chair fitting. I decided to select a topic that would bring together the major areas of my teaching and scholarship, labor and employment law and sexuality in law. These intersect in the question whether Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which bans employment discrimination against an individual because of his or her sex, will be open to claims by job applicants and workers that they've suffered discrimination because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. We're at a very decisive point in the judicial battle over that question, having achieved just a few weeks ago on April 4th the breakthrough of our first affirmative Court of Appeals ruling on the sexual orientation question, following several years of encouraging developments on the gender identity question. To understand the significance of this, we have to go back more than half a century to the period after World War II when the modern American gay rights movement began stirring with protests by recent military veterans against unequal benefits treatment. With the formation, beginning in 1950, of pioneering organizations like the Mattachine Society in Los Angeles and here in New York, the Daughters of Belitis in San Francisco, the vital behind-the-scenes work undertaken by gay scholars as the great law reform effort of the model penal code was launched by the American Law Institute. That post-war period of the late 1940s and 1950s played out alongside the rise of the civil rights movement for which the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was the signal achievement. The early gay rights advocacy groups had their agenda, their list of goals, and some kind of protection against discrimination was prominent among them. That task seemed monumental at a time when there was no federal statute prohibiting any kind of employment discrimination. Until Illinois adopted the Model Penal Code in 1960, which effectively repealed criminal sanctions for private consensual gay sex, it was a crime in every state, a serious felony with long prison sentences in many. President Eisenhower issued an executive order shortly after taking office banning the employment of, quote, sex perverts in the federal civil service. A major immigration law passed during the 1950s for the first time explicitly barred homosexuals from immigrating to the United States and qualifying for citizenship by labeling us as being afflicted by psychopathic personality, making us excludable on medical and moral grounds. The military barred gay people from serving on similar grounds as military psychiatrists deemed homosexuals to be mentally unfit for military service. Many lines of work that required state licensing and determinations of moral fitness systematically excluded LGBT people. To be an openly gay lawyer or doctor or public school teacher was virtually unthinkable in the 1950s and even on into the 1960s. When Congress was considering the landmark civil rights bill first introduced during the Kennedy administration and shepherded into law by Lyndon Johnson in 1964, the idea that lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, transgender people might obtain assistance rather than condemnation from Congress seemed like a pipe dream. None of the legislators proposed protecting members of these groups from discrimination in 1964. Title VII, the part of the bill dealing with employment, 
was limited in its original form to discrimination because of race or color, religion or national origin. A floor amendment offered in the House of Representatives by Howard Smith of Virginia, a conservative Southern Democrat who was opposed to enactment of the bill, proposed to add sex to the prohibited grounds for discrimination. The amendment carried, the bill passed, it went to the Senate where it was held up by one of the longest filibusters in American history up to that time. And at that time, to do a filibuster, you had to have people who were willing to speak around the clock until the chamber was so exhausted that enough people would vote to end the debate and bring the matter up. Today, they don't bother with the speaking. They just wait until they get 60 people who say that they're willing to vote to end the debate. The leadership of the Senate, trying to avoid having the bill bottled up in committees headed by conservative Southern senators, had sent the bill directly to the Senate floor with a tight limit on amendments. Thus, committee reports that would have provided a source of legislative history about the meaning of sex as used in the bill are totally lacking. The only floor amendment relating to the addition of sex to Title VII was to clarify that pay practices that were authorized under the Equal Pay Act, which had been passed the year before, would not be held to violate Title VII. The statute contained no definition of sex, and in the early years after its passage, the courts and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission agreed that the ban on sex discrimination in Title VII meant you couldn't treat women worse than men or men worse than women. With little agreement about even what that meant. In fact, in one early interpretive foray, the Supreme Court decided that Title VII did not prohibit discrimination against women who became pregnant. The resulting public outcry inspired Congress to amend the statute to make clear that discrimination against a woman because of pregnancy or childbirth was a form of sex discrimination. Early attempts by gay or transgender people to pursue discrimination claims under Title VII all crashed and burned. Protecting people from sexual orientation discrimination was not intended by Congress, said the courts. They embraced a literalistic, plain language interpretation of Title VII, including a very narrow biological understanding of sex. Although gay rights advocates persuaded U.S. Representative Bella Abza to introduce a bill to amend the Civil Rights Act to add, quote, sexual or affectional preference as prohibited grounds of discrimination during the 1970s, it had few co-sponsors and it basically went nowhere. But something began to happen as the courts considered a wider variety of sex discrimination claims over the ensuing decades. It became clear that a simplistic concept of sex would not be adequate to achieve the goal of equal opportunity. Legal theorists had been advancing the concept, for example, of a hostile environment as a form of discrimination, first focusing on the open hostility that many white workers showed to black, Latino, and Asian workers in newly integrated workplaces. During the 1970s, the courts began to expand that concept to women who experienced hostility in formerly all-male workplaces. Lower federal courts were divided about whether such atmospherics could be considered terms or conditions of employment within the scope of the act when they didn't directly involve a refusal to hire or differences in pay or work assignments. Finally, the Supreme Court broke the deadlock in the lower courts in 1986, holding in the case of Meritor Savings Bank against Vinson that a woman who experienced workplace hostility that was so severe that it affected her terms and conditions of employment would have a sex discrimination claim. And subsequent cases clarified that the plaintiff did not have to show a tangible injury, although proving that working conditions were so intolerable that a reasonable person would quit clearly met the test of a hostile environment. Some courts began to extend this reasoning to complaints by men in situations where mainly male co-workers subjected them to verbal and even physical harassment. The courts also began to grapple with the problem of sexual stereotyping and how easily employers and co-workers could fall into stereotype thinking to the disadvantage of minorities and women. Stereotypes, for example, about a young mother's ability to balance work and home obligations. Stereotypes about the ability of women to do physically challenging work. 
stereotypes about female longevity and the costs of funding retirement plans. All of these issues came before the Supreme Court and ultimately led the court to expand the concept of sex discrimination more broadly than legislators of the mid-1960s would have imagined. The key stereotyping case for building a theory of protection for sexual minorities was decided in 1989, Price Waterhouse against Hopkins. Ann Hopkins' bid for partnership at Price Waterhouse was denied because some partners considered her inadequately feminine. They embraced a stereotype about how a woman partner was supposed to look and behave. Hopkins, with her loud and abrasive manner and somewhat masculine appearance, failed to conform to that stereotype. Communicating the firm's decision to pass over her partnership application, the head of her office told her she could improve her chances for the next round by dressing more femininely, walking more femininely, toning down her speech, wearing makeup and jewelry, and having her hair styled. Her substantial contributions to the firm, her leadership in generating new business, counted for almost nothing when decision makers decided she was inadequately feminine to meet their expectations of a, quote, lady partner. In an opinion by Justice William J. Brennan, Jr., the court accepted Hopkins' argument that allowing such considerations to affect the partnership decision could be evidence of a prohibited discriminatory motivation because of her sex. The court's opinion embraced the idea that discrimination because of gender, not just discrimination because of biological sex, came within the scope of Title VII. The statutory policy included wiping away gender stereotypes that created barriers to equal opportunity in the workplace. Although Ann Hopkins was not a lesbian and nothing was said about homosexuality in her case, the ruling's implications became obvious as federal courts dealt with a variety of stereotyping claims. A person who suffered discrimination because she did not appear or act the way people expected a woman to appear or act was now protected. And that sounded to lots of people like a description of discrimination against transgender people and some, but perhaps not all, lesbians, gay men, and bisexuals. The argument seemed particularly strong when an employer discriminated against a person who was hired appearing and acting as a man and then began to transition to living as a woman. At the same time, legal academics had begun to publish theoretical arguments supporting the idea that discrimination against gay people was a form of sex discrimination. Among the earliest of these was Professor Sylvia Law of New York University, whose 1988 article in the Wisconsin Law Review titled Homosexuality and the Social Meaning of Gender suggested that anti-gay discrimination was about, quote, preserving traditional concepts of masculinity and femininity. Professor Law's pioneering work was quickly followed by the first of many articles by Andrew Kopelman. First, in a student note he published in the Yale Law Journal in 1988, titled The Miscegenation Analogy, Sodomy Law as Sex Discrimination. Later, his 1994 article in the New York University Law Review titled Why Discrimination Against Lesbians and Gay Men is Sex Discrimination. Both Kopelman, who's now a professor at Northwestern University, and Professor Law proposed theoretical arguments for treating anti-gay discrimination as sex discrimination. Seizing upon the Price Waterhouse precedent, transgender people and gay people began to succeed in court in their discrimination claims under Title VII by arguing that their failure to conform to gender stereotypes was the reason they were denied hiring or continued employment, desirable assignments, promotions. A strange dynamic began to grow in the courts as judges repeated over and over again that Title VII did not prohibit discrimination because of sexual orientation or gender identity, but that it did prohibit discrimination against a person because of his or her failure to conform to gender stereotypes. Many of the courts insisted, however, that there was one gender stereotype that could not be the basis of a Title VII claim, that men should be attracted only to women and women should be attracted only to men. To allow a plaintiff to assert such a stereotype claim would dissolve the line that courts were trying to preserve between stereotyping claims and sexual orientation or gender identity claims. 
Decades of past precedents stood in the way of acknowledging the unworkability of that line. Ten years after the Price Waterhouse decision, the Supreme Court decided another sex discrimination case on Colley versus Sundowner Offshore Services with an opinion by Justice Scalia that helped to fuel the broadening interpretation of Title VII, probably to his surprise and maybe even dismay. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals had ruled that a man who was subjected to workplace harassment of a sexual nature by other men could not bring a hostile environment lawsuit under Title VII. The Court of Appeals reasoned that Congress intended in 1964 to prohibit discrimination against women because they were women or against men because they were men, and that such a limited intent by Congress could not encompass claims of same-sex harassment. Reversing this ruling for a unanimous court Justice Scalia, who was generally skeptical about the use of legislative history to interpret statutes, wrote that the interpretation of Title VII was not restricted to the intentions of the 1964 Congress. While conceding that same-sex harassment was not one of the, quote, evils that Congress was intending to attack by adding sex to Title VII, he wrote, statutory prohibitions often go beyond the principal evil to cover reasonably comparable evils. And it is ultimately the provisions of our laws rather than the principal concerns of our legislators by which we are governed. Title VII prohibits discrimination because of sex and employment. This must extend to sex-based discrimination of any kind that meets the statutory requirements. Thus, our collective societal understanding of sex, gender, sexuality, sexual identity, sexual orientation broadens, and our concept of sex discrimination as prohibited by Title VII also broadens. With the combined force of the Price Waterhouse decision and the Onkali decision, some federal courts began to push the boundaries even further during the first decade of the 21st century. By the time the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission ruled in 2012 in the case of Macy versus Holder, a federal sector sex discrimination case, that a transgender plaintiff could pursue a Title VII claim against a division of the Justice Department, its opinion could at that point cite a multitude of federal court decisions in support of that conclusion, including two decisions by the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals involving public safety workers who were transitioning on the job and were fired, and a 2011 ruling by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals that a Georgia state agency's discrimination against an employee because she was transitioning violated the Equal Protection Clause as sex discrimination. There was also federal appellate rulings under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, the Violence Against Women Act, as well as numerous trial court rulings under Title VII. So the EEOC was following the trend, not leading the parade, when it found that discrimination against a person because of their gender identity was, in fact, sex discrimination. After the Supreme Court's landmark ruling in Lawrence versus Texas in 2003, striking down the Texas sodomy law under the 14th Amendment, and further rulings in 2013 and 2015 in the Windsor and Obergefell cases, leading to a national right to marry for same-sex couples, the persistence by many courts in asserting that Title VII did not prohibit sexual orientation discrimination appeared increasingly archaic. Just weeks after the Obergefell decision, the EEOC issued another landmark ruling in July 2015, Baldwin v. Fox, reversing half a century of the agency's precedent and holding that sexual orientation discrimination claims were necessarily sex discrimination claims covered by Title VII. The commission ruled that a gay air traffic controller could bring a claim against the Department of Transportation challenging its refusal to hire him for a full-time position in the Miami Air Traffic Control Center because of his sexual orientation. Building on the Price Waterhouse on Cali and Macy decisions, the EEOC embraced several alternative theories to support this ruling. One was the now well-established proposition that an employer may not rely on sex-based considerations or take gender into account when making employment decisions unless sex was a bona fide occupational qualification, a narrow statutory exception that is rarely relevant 
to a sexual orientation or gender identity case. The commission wrote, quote, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation is premised on sex-based preferences, assumptions, expectations, stereotypes, and norms. Sexual orientation as a concept cannot be defined or understood without reference to sex. Sexual orientation is inseparable from and inescapably linked to sex. And therefore, allegations of sexual orientation discrimination involve sex-based considerations. By the summer of 2015, the agency was able to cite several federal court decisions applying these concepts in particular cases. Another theory was based on the associational discrimination concept. Courts had increasingly accepted the argument that discrimination against a person because he or she was in an interracial relationship was discrimination because of race. The analogy was irresistible. Discriminating against someone because they are in a same-sex relationship must be sex discrimination because it involved taking the employee's sex into account. Denying a job because a man is partnered with a man rather than with a woman means that his sex, as well as his partner's sex, was taken into account by the employer in making the decision. Finally, the, com the commission embraced the stereotyping theory, even to the extent that some courts had refused to embrace it, that sexual orientation discrimination is sex discrimination because it necessarily involves discrimination based on gender stereotypes. Not just those involving appearance or mannerisms or grooming or speech, but also stereotypes about appropriate sexual attraction. Quoting a Massachusetts federal trial court ruling, the agency wrote, sexual orientation, discrimination, and harassment are often, if not always, motivated by a desire to enforce heterosexually defined gender norms. The harasser may discriminate against an openly gay coworker or a coworker that he perceives to be gay, whether effeminate or not, because he thinks real men should date women and not other men. Professor Sylvia Law's theoretical proposition of 1988 was now surfacing in court and agency rulings a quarter century later. The EEOC also rejected the view that adopting this expanded definition of sex discrimination required new congressional action, pointing out that the courts had been expanding the definition of sex under Title VII continuously since the 1970s, with minimal intervention or assistance by Congress. Since 2015, the issue of sexual orientation discrimination under Title VII has risen to the level of the Circuit Courts of Appeals. In most of the circuits, there are precedents dating back decades holding that sexual orientation claims may not be litigated under Title VII. These precedents are softened in some circuits which have accepted discrimination claims from gay men or lesbians who plausibly asserted that their visible departure from gender stereotypes provoke the discrimination against them. But many of these appeals courts have strained to draw a line between the former and the latter and have rejected stereotyping claims where they perceive them as attempts to, quote, bootstrap a sexual orientation claim into Title VII territory. Ironically, one judge who emphatically rejected such a case several years ago with the bootstrapping objection was Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit. He is the author of a concurring opinion in this new round of circuit court rulings in which he argued that it is legitimate for federal courts to update statutes without waiting for Congress in order to bring them into line with current social trends. This was part of the Seventh Circuit's on-bank ruling in Kimberly Hively versus Ivy Tech Community College the decision that is the first by a federal appeals court to embrace all aspects of the EEOC's Baldwin decision. Judge Posner's argument echoes one made decades ago by Guido Calabresi, then a professor at Yale, now a judge on the Second Circuit, in a series of lectures published as a book titled A Common Law for the Age of Statutes. Calabresi argued that legislative inertia would justify courts in updating old statutes to meet contemporary needs through creative interpretations. Although Judge Posner did not cite Calabresi's book, his argument is much the same. He quoted both Justice Scalia's comment from the Oncali case and an earlier iteration of a similar sentiment in an opinion by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. way back in 1920 
in which Holmes wrote, quote, the case before us must be considered in the light of our whole experience and not merely in that of what was said 100 years ago. The federal circuit courts follow the rule that when a three-judge panel interprets a statute, it creates a binding precedent that can be reversed only by the full bench of the court, an on-bank ruling, or by the Supreme Court, or by Congress, of course, changing the statute. The Hively ruling from the Seventh Circuit reversed a three-judge panel decision that had rejected the plaintiff's Title VII claim based on prior circuit precedents. The on-bank panel voted eight to three. Incidentally, five of the judges in the eight-member majority were appointees of Republican presidents, most of them appointees of Ronald Reagan. The employer in that case quickly announced that it would not seek Supreme Court review, but this ruling creates a split among the circuit courts for the first time on the question whether sexual orientation discrimination is covered by Title VII, and the Supreme Court is usually interested in resolving circuit splits over the interpretation of federal statutes but somebody has to ask them to do it. The Seventh Circuit opinion by Chief Judge Diane Wood accepted all of the EEOC's theories from the Baldwin case. Judge Wood concluded that, quote, it would require considerable calisthenics to remove the sex from sexual orientation. We hold that a person who alleges that she experienced employment discrimination on the basis of her sexual orientation has put forth a case of sex discrimination for Title VII purposes. Dissenting judge Diane Sykes criticized the majority for deploying what she called, quote, a judge-empowering common law decision method that leaves a great deal of room for judicial discretion. Well, she's right. That's what Guido Calabresi said in his book, A Common Law for the Age of Statutes. Use common law methods to interpret old statutes to adjust them to modern times. So here the battle is joined over statutory interpretation. For the majority, it is appropriate to trace the development of case law over decades, treating the concept of sex discrimination as an evolving one. For Judge Posner, concurring, it is legitimate for the court to set aside the pretense of ordinary interpretation and to boldly update an old statute to reflect contemporary understandings. For Judge Sykes, these approaches are illegitimate because in her view, they violate the division of authority between the legislature and the courts for a court to adopt an interpretation that would be outside the understanding of the legislators who enacted the statute. Now the scenario is playing out in other circuits. In recent weeks, the Atlanta-based 11th Circuit and the New York-based 2nd Circuit have issued three-judge panel rulings refusing to allow sexual orientation discrimination claims under Title VII. The panels did not consider the issue afresh. They did not decide to reaffirm old rulings on the merits. They just said they were powerless to do so because of existing circuit precedents. In both cases decided in March, Evans versus Georgia Regional Hospital and Christensen versus Omnicom Group, the panel sent the cases back to the trial court to see whether they could be litigated as sex stereotyping cases instead of sexual orientation cases. But one judge dissented in the 11th Circuit arguing that an old pre-Price Waterhouse precedent should no longer be treated as a binding circuit precedent in that circuit. The second circuit panel rejected the trial judge's conclusion that because the gay plaintiff's complaint included evidence that his treatment was tainted by homophobia, thus he could not assert a sex stereotyping claim. And two members of the three judge panel wrote a concurring opinion, virtually accepting the EEOC's view of the matter and suggesting that the circuit should reconsider the question on bank. In both cases, the panels took the position that sex stereotyping claims should be evaluated without reference to the sexual orientation of the plaintiff. And in both of these cases, lawyers for the plaintiffs are asking the circuit to convene on bank benches to reconsider the issue as a preliminary to seeking possible Supreme Court review. Since there have been more Second Circuit panel rulings just in the past week or two, uh, it's clear that this issue is going to move fast. One or more of these petitions for on-bank review is likely to be granted. We may see more on-bank rulings in favor of allowing sexual orientation discrimination claims, and it is even possible that an emerging consensus from the circuit courts will make a Supreme Court ruling unnecessary.
but it seems more likely that a disappointed litigant will seek Supreme Court review of one of these rulings. I think the question will be before the Supreme Court within the next two years. Which leads to the highly speculative game, on which I will conclude, of handicapping potential Supreme Court rulings. Now we're in the land of speculation. Neil Gorsuch's confirmation essentially restores the ideological balance that existed before Justice Scalia's death. The court, as it was then constituted, decided the historic same-sex marriage cases, Windsor and Obergefell, with Justice Kennedy, a Republican appointee, riding for the court in both cases, as well as he did in the earlier gay rights victories, Romer versus Evans and Lawrence versus Texas. These opinions suggest a degree of empathy for gay litigants that might lead Justice Kennedy to embrace an expansive interpretation of Title VII. He is, after all, part of a generation of appellate judges appointed in the 1980s by Ronald Reagan, who made up half of the majority in the recent Seventh Circuit ruling. Richard Posner, Frank Easterbrook, Joel Flom, and Kenneth Ripple, all conservative appointees of a Republican president. Another member of that majority, Judge Alana Rovner, was appointed by Reagan's successor, George H.W. Bush. This Republican lineup underlies optimism that Kennedy might join with the Clinton-Obama appointees on the Supreme Court to produce a five-judge majority that would embrace the EEOC's interpretation. Such optimism may also draw on Kennedy's decisive rejection of the argument that legal rules are frozen at the time of their adoption and not susceptible to new interpretations in response to evolving social understandings. This was, in fact, the underlying theme of his opinions in the four major gay rights decisions, and especially Lawrence and Obergefell. A big question, of course, is whether he would consider that issue to be different when construing a moderately old statute like Title VII as compared to a much older constitutional provision like the 14th Amendment or the Fifth Amendment in the, uh, in the Windsor case dating from 1791. Since the 1970s, supporters of gay rights have introduced bills in Congress to amend the federal civil rights laws to provide explicit protection for LGBT people, none of those attempts has succeeded. If the judicial battle reaches a happy conclusion, those efforts might be rendered unnecessary, although there's always a danger in statutory law of Congress overruling through amendment. That seems unlikely unless the Republicans attain a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate or the filibuster for legislation is abolished. Who knows what may happen in the next few years? It's really hard to look ahead. But on that quasi-optimistic note, I conclude with thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions that people might want to pose. Anyone want to? Time for Q&A. <laughs> Since sex wasn't defined, have any of the judges looked at it as sex, as having sex? Having sex. In Title VII? You mean yeah. if someone's discriminated against because they have sex with the boss's daughter or son? Well, that would certainly define their sex. Uh, they, they've never talked about it in those terms. But uh, the idea of constitutional protection for having sex, of course, is at the heart of Lawrence versus Texas. It, it says that that comes within the sphere of liberty protected by the Due Process Clause of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. Yeah. Uh, congratulations. congratulations on one of your first students. <laughs> Thank you, James. I remember. <laughs> uh, how do you respond to the fact that a number of jurisdictions, a fairly substantial number of jurisdictions, have recognized sexual orientation as a protected class, looking, for example, in New York City, New York State, and many other jurisdictions have found that, including briefly uh, a jurisdiction in North Carolina. Uh, unlike, the, the, it seems to me that the argument would be that Congress is perfectly capable of revising the statute much more readily than it is amending the Constitution, and that, how do you respond to that? Well, I respond to that in a way that the courts do, because uh, if you look back over the history of litigation on this, uh, 
if you read cases on this issue from the 1980s or the 1990s, they frequently said, Congress has been presented with bills over the years, over and over again, to add, in the early years, affectional preference or uh, various other phrases, but now it's, it's always sexual orientation and gender identity or expression, uh, and they have never passed the bills. And we draw from that the view that Congress thinks this is not a subject that should be addressed by federal law. Uh, and in these recent cases, the courts have said, well, you know, you shouldn't read too much into the fact that a bill didn't pass Congress because you never know why particular members of Congress vote the way they do. And it's, it's not a good idea to sort of overinterpret the collective action of the body. And most of those bills never even got a committee hearing uh, or came up for any kind of vote. Uh, so the argument is now that there is inertia in Congress. We know that this issue is blocked in Congress. There is public opinion that has swung strongly in favor of banning such discrimination. The latest Gallup polls that I've seen on this are in 60, 70% of the general population. In fact, the majority of the population thinks it's already illegal to discriminate on this basis because they watch too much TV. <laughs> You know, but uh, I, the, the answer is that the courts will step in, and they have in many areas of the law, where legislation lags behind and something needs to be done. Uh, part of it is our common law tradition of courts working with doctrine, making changes to doctrine in response to changing times. And part of it is the idea that we have a different understanding of some of the concepts covered by Title VII than the legislators had in 1964. I mean, I think if, if you read Justice Kennedy's opinions in Lawrence and Obergefell and see how he treats history and original meaning and new understandings of things that we didn't understand quite as well in older times, uh, you see an openness to judges being creative to deal with a social problem. And I think a lot of judges are embarrassed about the fact that they have to dismiss sexual orientation claims under Title VII. A significant number of these cases are designated as not for publication. Yes. Thank you, Arthur, for your leadership in the Apostle and your very clear lecture. I have a question. Um, to what extent does progress in court based on the Chevron definition? Right. Well, because, yeah, the, the question was how much of the progress in the courts is due to Chevron deference, to the fact that the EEOC and uh, several other agencies during, during the Obama administration interpreted sex discrimination laws or regulations as applying to gender identity or sexual orientation. Uh, not much of it at this point. Uh, it might happen. The EEOC decision gets cited, but uh, the courts don't say that they're deferring to it when they're doing this. And I know that there is some disposition among some members of the Supreme Court to cut back on the deference theory. Uh, there uh, was a possibility that they might have actually done it if they had gone ahead with that Title IX case where they granted cert, the uh, school, the transgender uh, high school student. Uh, and then the Trump administration withdrew the interpretation that the Fourth Circuit had relied on and deferred to. And so the question didn't come up it's bound to arise again. I, I know that there's, uh, there's a feeling that uh, Chevron deference uh, may cede too much policy making to administrative agencies, especially agencies that tend to pass far-reaching regulations that go far beyond what Congress thought they were doing when they delegated them authority to make regulations in the first place. I know this is one of your main issues. And uh, to what extent, is the difference between the executive branch and the legislative branch being seriously eroded with a loss of political accountability for major decision making when you have politically unaccountable agencies making policy decisions. And I think that argument could be uh, focused on the EEOC in this case. Are they legislating or are they merely interpreting? You see it played out in the Seventh Circuit opinions. It's really fun to read them. Not just 
gender stereotyping generally if Ann Hopkins had been a lesbian? If she had been a lesbian. Yeah, what if Ann Hopkins had been a lesbian? How would that have affected uh, the, the development of the law? Uh, maybe we would have seen these recent developments much earlier. Uh, because uh, the courts would have a clear case of the Supreme Court saying that this mannish lesbian is entitled to bring a sex discrimination claim because of gender stereotypes. It took a while. It, uh, from, from Hopkins in 1989, it wasn't until 2006 that we had the first Circuit Court of Appeals uh, decision that really overtly accepted the idea that uh, gender stereotyping of a transgender person would be sex discrimination under Title VII. But that opinion was quickly followed by many more. Uh, so if, if Anne Hopkins, had, if she'd been an out lesbian, uh, maybe the Supreme Court wouldn't have decided the case the same way. Maybe 1989, it would have been sort of premature to expect them to go that far. It's interesting to watch how it sort of develops over time in incremental steps. Yes? Well, given that um, Justice Scalia Well, that's, that's the notion of using a common law process, however. Uh, you know, I think one of the things is Scalia wrote a very quotable few sentences there that you can rip out of context and do with them what you will. And, you know, when I, when I saw the EEOC do that, uh, both in the Macy case and, and then in the Baldwin case, I thought, well, Scalia must be outraged at this. Although, uh, you know, the EEOC did that. And then six months later, Scalia dropped dead. Is there any connection? I don't know. Was he outraged that his quote was being used all over the place? But, you know, because I don't think Scalia wasn't saying strict interpretation of the language. Because uh, strict interpretation of the language wouldn't have necessarily decided the Ancali case that way. Uh, unless, you know, you put it back in its context and read the entire opinion and see that what he was saying is that there's nothing in Title VII that says that the sex of an individual is relevant in any way to the question whether Title VII covers their sex discrimination claim. The issue is, are they being discriminated because of their sex? And he says, if Mr. Onkali was being discriminated against because of his sex, then he has a claim. And for the, for the Fifth Circuit to say that same-sex harassment claims can't be brought is nonsense. It depends why the person is being discriminated against. He, and he gave examples. He said, what if there is a homosexual supervisor who's constantly hitting on a straight male employee? That's same-sex harassment. That should be actionable under Title VII because the victim is being selected because of his sex. And so I think people are taking Scalia's statement and using it to support an interpretation that I don't think he would necessarily support but it seems that Posner is supporting it, and Easterbrook, who I think is more conservative than Posner, is supporting it, and these other Reagan appointees on the Seventh Circuit are supporting it. So perhaps there's an idea that there is a group of Republican appointees on the bench who are maybe more socially libertarian, maybe economic conservatives, you know, maybe they're, they have broader views and they have more flexibility in their approach. And they're willing to change with the times. I mean, if you read Posner's book, Sex and Law, which is now about 25 years old, there are things in there that he would never say today. He has evolved. And there's, in fact, a, a recent biography of Judge Posner, the first full-length biography of him, which is fascinating to read, which charts his evolution on many of these issues, where he is taking very different positions today 
than he took back in the 1980s when he first went on the bench. A few years ago, Arthur, you put together a fabulous law review conference on motions to dismiss for failure to state a claim, a um, civil procedure device that is the, most, the base of most of these cases. And you had an empirical assessment of some of your speakers were talking about how the Supreme Court has made it easier to dismiss cases, and it was dramatically affecting employment um, cases. Have you seen, have you been following it since the conference a few years ago, and have people been able to not only survive the motion because of the legal analysis, but that more courts are willing to allow them to do discovery to establish the discrimination and the intent of the employer? Well, I think we, we have two things that have been going on. One is the Supreme Court did give people a roadmap. And so I think uh, plaintiff's attorneys in employment discrimination cases are now better informed about what kinds of factual material they have to put in their complaints in order to meet the new pleading standards. But another thing is, and this is something that I've been noticing as, I, as I've been tracking these court of appeals decisions on sexual orientation, President Obama in his first term got to appoint a lot of court of appeals judges. Uh, there are circuits, the Fourth Circuit, for example, which was traditionally one of the most conservative circuits, has been totally flipped as a result of Obama appointees. It's now one of the more liberal circuits. And uh, I was just looking into the Second and Eleventh Circuits because of these pending on um, bank petitions, and both of them, uh, the political balance of the president who appointed the judges, which isn't always a totally accurate predictor of how the judges are going to vote, but the political balance of both of those circuits has drastically changed over the past four or five years. And I would suspect that that also results in uh, less hostility to employment discrimination cases and perhaps allowing uh, more leeway to plaintiffs. In, in recognition of, I think, one of the main complaints that was made by many of the speakers at that symposium was that when uh, an attorney is framing a, an employment discrimination complaint for a plaintiff, they don't have access to a whole lot of information. Basically, they have what their client can tell them. Until you can get discovery, you really don't have all that information that's in the possession of the employer that would really help you make your case. And in order to get to discovery, you usually have to survive a motion to dismiss because employers almost routinely file motions to dismiss in employment discrimination cases. So, I, and I think it's possible that as the complexion of the courts of appeals has changed over the past few years, maybe they're more open to that argument that uh, there's enough here in this complaint to give the plaintiff a chance to go back and try to get some discovery. In fact, you see that in these recent cases from the Second and Eleventh Circuits where they denied the sexual orientation claim, but they said, maybe the current complaint doesn't go far enough to do this, but we see in the narrative that we've got the seeds of a stereotyping theory. Let's send it back and give the plaintiff a chance to file an amended complaint and see if they can come up with a valid stereotyping claim under our existing circuit precedent. It's an, an interesting development. And courts used to just dismiss the case. Now they're saying, well, send it back and give them a chance to file an amended complaint. Because uh, I think, as I say, I think many of the judges are embarrassed that they're stuck with this statute that doesn't cover sexual orientation when it seems to them that logically it should. That certainly is the tone of Judge Katzman's concurring opinion in the Christensen case, which is very emphatic in accepting these uh, arguments that sexual orientation should be considered uh, like sex discrimination. Well, we're way over time to get to the refreshments. So if no one else has questions, we'll end on that note.